Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. Today I'm sitting down with Jose Monkey, a content creator, online privacy and safety advocate, and amateur OSINT researcher who is known for his TikTok channel where he geolocates videos sent to him. Jose Monkey, thanks for joining us. Hey Aubrey. You will notice he is using a pseudonym um, because he does not want to share his personal identity. So Jose Monkey, can you tell us how you got started with geolocation and why you wanted to make TikTok videos about it? Sure. I have been interested in geolocation and, um, you know, kind of being able to figure out where, you know, photos and videos were, um, were recorded for a very long time. It's just something I've always done. Uh, well, I wouldn't say always, but what I've done for many years as a bit of a hobby. And um, a little over a year ago, I thought there might be an interest in doing that um, in a social media environment. And I, I found people who were posting videos and saying, can anyone guess where I am? And so I decided to reply to a few of them and say, yeah, I think I can. And, and then explained how I found where they were. And so it kind of took off, um, you know, shortly after I started doing that. And, and now people ask me all the time to try to find them in the videos that they record. And I try to do that for them. And we should note that you're really intentional about who you take videos from. It's always with consent and people who are asking to be found. That's right. And I, I really, I try to impress upon people that like, obviously I only do it for people who are asking me to do it for them. People who are over 18. And I also have tried to put in place various um, kind of rules that people need to follow when they submit it to make it really clear that this is a video that someone recorded with this specific intent to have me reveal the location, not just some video that maybe they found somewhere and sent to me. So uh, yeah, I try to really take safety into consideration in all of what we're doing. It's it's fun, but we're trying to, to be safe as well. Awesome. So um, let's get into like how you break down a video because I find yeah. I always learn something whenever I'm watching your videos. And one thing I asked you about was just when you're starting out, someone sends you this video, sometimes they're in a city, sometimes it's out in the country. What are you looking for and how do you get started? Yeah, it's, um, it's really interesting to do the kind of thing that I'm doing because it requires you to look at things maybe differently than, um, you know, people normally would. Like most people watch a video and they just look at what's going on in the video. Um, when you're doing something like what I'm doing, where you're trying to find all the details that might help you figure out where the video or, or photo was was taken, um, you really want to look at it um, in a very analytical way where you're looking at all the details, you know, very, very small details, sometimes things that are only on, on screen, um, you know, in a corner of the photo or just a few frames. And those are all the details that are going to help you to analyze it and glean as much information as possible. So it really requires, um, you know, kind of a, a you know, a, a thoughtful approach to, to really critically looking at what you're seeing. And you mentioned that you kind of separate things into two buckets, clues and details. Um, can you give an example of what each one is? Sure. So, so yeah, when I look at a photo or video and try to figure out um, where it is, uh, the first thing I do is I really, I really just try to observe as much as I can about it and, and really write down everything I see, every, everything I see in the video, um, whether it seems relevant or not. And then once I do that, I try to take those things and put them into two buckets. One is a set of things, which I will call clues, which I think are going to give me information that will help me to start my search or narrow down the search, things that, that might help to reveal the location or information that I think could lead to um, you know, me finding the location. And I would contrast that against other things in the video that um, are more like interesting or distinctive details that could be helpful later on when I try to confirm the location, but are probably not things that I could use to start looking for it. Um, so some examples of each. Um, a clue would be something that something useful that's going to tell me where I should be looking. Like maybe it's something that tells you uh, the, the region that you're in or the country that you're in. Maybe I see a, a flag for a country, or maybe it's a license plate for a particular US state. Um, or it could be, you know, other things like business names or, you know, other things that you see in the video that start to give you an idea of what things you could be looking for. I think of those things as clues. But there are other things that you might see in a, a photo or video, which, you know, maybe maybe you observe that there's like 
a white picket fence or there's a, a tree, you know, with a very crooked trunk or, you know, or something like that. Those are very interesting details and they may come in useful later, but they're not something you're going to start with. You're not going to go to Google and say, show me the place with the, the white picket fence and the crooked tree. That's just not, not how it works, at least not right now. Amazing if it was how it worked with AI. Yeah. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into one of the places you have geolocated. We're going to queue up a video and just watch a snippet. This video was sent to me by a mom who was hoping that I could help demonstrate those risks to her kid. I have a 10 year old who doesn't understand the risk behind social media. So I just wanted to show her something. So tell me where I am, Jose Monkey. Okay, I hope your 10 year old is watching. So what can we see? This video was recorded in selfie mode, so the first thing I did was flip it horizontally. One of the first things I noticed is that there's a CVS directly behind mom at the beginning of the video. And behind the CVS, we can see a water tower. As mom turns the camera, we can see that there's a parking lot here and also a building that looks like an apartment or hotel. After that, we briefly catch a glimpse of some other people in the background and a small garage or shed here. So right away, uh, kind of a duh moment for me is that you immediately flip the video around horizontally because it's in mm -hmm. selfie mode for clarity. And yeah. I think that just hasn't even occurred to me, which is my amateur level at this. <laughs> well, it's, it's really tricky to know when to do it and when not to. Sometimes um, it's very obvious that the video is reversed. You see writing or something that's backwards or something written on somebody's shirt or something like that. And you're like, oh, well, this is obviously reversed. I should, I should turn it around. Um, but other times it's less clear. Um, and so deciding whether or not to flip it around is sometimes one of the things that I, I need to do early on. And it can be hard in certain situations. Um, I had, you know, one video where like, I, I really couldn't tell for a long time. And I actually found that I was thinking it was not reversed for a very long time. And I was having trouble making the details in the, the video match where I thought it was. And eventually it clicked for me that it was reversed and everything lined up from there. So yeah, that, that is a, a tricky part of it. Yeah, there's another video you where you use the model of the car she's standing yeah. in front of and which side the gas tank on it to realize that it's been flipped. Yep, yeah, that video, um, which was in Arizona, um, I was, uh, it was really gonna be important to make sure that I knew whether it was reversed or not, because I was going to be trying to match some things um, with like a reverse image search and things like that, that could really get thrown off if the, you know, the image was flipped. And, um, and it, there were not a lot of details to help me figure that out. Um, but yeah, in that case, I figured out what kind of car it was. I could see the fuel door and I knew it was on the wrong side from what I could see in the video. And um, the thing that was interesting is that lots of people have commented on that video and said, well, obviously you can tell it's reversed because the person was wearing sunglasses and you can see them holding up their phone in the, in the sunglasses. So you can tell they're using the front facing camera, which often will be reversed. But um, the thing that I, I tried to point out to people is that just because they're using the front facing camera doesn't necessarily mean the video will be reversed when they post it. Um, sometimes it is, especially if they record the video right inside of an app like TikTok and post it then it will often be reversed. But if they record it beforehand and upload it, a lot of times it's not. So um, so yeah, you, sometimes you really have to like look at the details to make sure you're, you're certain about that. Well, and I think years ago, the front facing camera used to just be like so much lower quality <laughs> right. that it was really obvious, but now they're getting so much better. Oh yeah. Yeah, the cameras um, on phones, both front and back are, are really such high quality at this point. Um, it, it honestly, it, it really makes it, um, a lot easier to pick out details. Um, I think people don't realize because we we take these photos and videos on our phones and we share them, you know, on these social media platforms, and we're often looking at them on a small screen on our phones. But if you take those videos and you know view them on a computer on a monitor that's large and zoom in, sometimes like you'd be amazed at, at how high quality some of them are. You can really see a lot of details in the background. Yeah. So one thing you use to locate this particular video is the sun direction and shadows. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you go into that and this, this sort of aerial sketch that you make? Yeah. So um, obviously, you know, we know that the you know sun rises in the east, sets in the west. And when there is uh, either a sunset or a sunrise happening um, in a photo or video, that is the easiest um, to identify, right? Because then you know, okay, I see it's either coming up or going down. I know it's one one or the other, east or west. Um, and it can be a lot trickier when the sun's higher in the sky and then you need to like really think about 
um, you know, depending on where the person might be, how the shadows will fall, it'll be very different if they're in the northern hemisphere versus in the southern hemisphere. So, so that can be really tricky. But when it's a sunrise or a sunset, that is where it can be like really helpful because you you know, you know, the direction that you're looking at where the sun is is going to be one or the other. And there are often other clues that can help you figure out whether this is a sunrise or a sunset, even if visually they look kind of the same. You can usually tell by like what's going on in the video. Is this likely to have been early in the morning or is it, you know, more likely to be in the evening? So, so yeah, that can be, um, you know, kind of a, a big, uh, a big clue um, because then it can really narrow down when you're looking at candidate locations. You know, if things are not pointing in the right direction, you can just rule them out right away. Nice. So something that I guess I found funny whenever I was watching this is for whatever reason, right away, I was like, I think this is a church the siding and kind of the yeah. big empty parking lot, it just sort of looked like a rural church to mm -hmm. me. Yeah, and I had that. I went with that assumption, if I was trying to geolocate this, I would have gone down this completely what ends up being a wrong rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. Do you ever have that where you, do you trust your gut on things or has it taken you to the wrong place? And how do you balance that? Oh, absolutely. Um, it's, it's something that you have to watch out for. Um, Sometimes intuition can be really great and helpful and can um, can lead you to conclusions that you might not have gotten to strictly following the facts. And sometimes you get lucky and sometimes you don't. So you have to be really careful with that. Um, so I think that um, when you do this kind of thing a lot, you start to get a bit more of a, an intuition about these things where you can you know when you can kind of trust it that what you're you think you're looking at is what you think. But I've certainly gone, you know, completely off on the wrong, you know, on a wild goose chase um, because I made a bad assumption. Um, I think in some cases um, it, it ends up just being like a, a silly detail that doesn't really matter so much. Um, I had a really kind of funny example where um, um, in a video that I was doing, um, I think it was in North Carolina, um, I mentioned when I was breaking down the video and what I saw and what I was you know, looking for for this place, I mentioned that I saw a sign that said United on the side of it. And I talked later about how I just, I didn't find that sign. I don't know why. When I went to that place, I just couldn't find the sign. And somebody pointed out in the comments, it was just sort of like an optical illusion that what I thought was a sign was a United truck that was going by, like the person was getting ready to go over an overpass and it was down below. And I mean, your eyes can trick you and make you think it was a sign, but once you know it's a truck, it's like, well, that, that was a really silly mistake. Um, but people made the same uh, mistake, actually, in uh, episode uh, 190 from season one that you were talking about um, in in Georgia, because a lot of people in the comments asked me why I didn't use the Herc Rentals um, uh, store that they were seeing in the video to help narrow down the location. But that, too, was a truck. It was a parked truck in the background. But if you look at it fast, you might, you know, Miss, miss, uh, you know, misunderstand what you're seeing. And, and if you were to follow that, you might go off on a, you know, a wrong path. So is it just kind of practice that leads you to narrow down the things you want to focus on first? Um, yeah, I think practice helps. I mean, I still, I make, you know, I make mistakes like that all the time. Um, and I try to be really transparent with people when I, um, explain how I find places and when I have, you know, a dead end that I followed that didn't pan out, or if I did something that, you know, ended up being just just wrong. Um, because I really feel like it's important, especially for people who are trying to learn more about doing this kind of thing, it's important to see, you know, how it goes. Because there are some people who do something, you know, not unlike what I do, who like to present it in a way where they just say, boom, here's the location. And that can sometimes give people the impression that it doesn't take a lot of work and that you don't make mistakes when you're doing it. And that, you know, they might think like, wow, I can't do that. But um, I, I think it's worth it to to be transparent and show people like, you know, what it really takes to, to do something like this. Yeah. As someone who dabbles in GeoGuessr, I think mm -hmm. knowing the theory of how to do something and actually trying to do it for the first time, it's so much incredibly harder than you think it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's really, it's, it's fun, but, but definitely challenging. Yeah. Um, so one of the things you use that's a slightly more advanced technique in this is data mining. And you're actually writing code to examine OpenStreetMaps um, data to narrow down the location for you. Can you talk a little bit about how that works and how you kind of got started in coding? Yeah. So um, 
So what I am typically doing when I'm doing um, data mining against the OpenStreetMap database for um, the uh, places that I find for the videos that I create, um, I'm usually doing that um, you know, using a query language called Overpass that um, a lot of people use for that purpose. Um, it is not um, very intense coding for people who are, you know, hardcore software engineers who've been doing it for many years, they would look at what I'm doing and they would definitely say like, okay, well, this isn't like, you know, like you're not writing, you know, lines and lines of, of what they might think of as code. I often talk about it as coding in my videos as a bit of a shorthand, but um, I have done, I, you know, I've done coding in various different programming languages, um, you know, in, in other contexts. And I'd say what I do for this is a bit different, but um, it definitely requires, um, uh, just a bit of a, you know, sort of a technical skill set that is very adjacent to to writing code. Um, so I think if people are are wondering about, you know, how how you get started with something like that, I think learning about the query language that you use to do the kinds of data mining queries that I do, um, it's it's something that's pretty accessible. I think that anybody with an interest could could pick that up, even if they don't have years and years of experience, you know, writing code in various languages. Yeah, and one of the things you do is, for instance, finding where is a CVS within this many meters of a water tower? Where is the no. Wendy's within this many meters of a CVS? And whenever, even based on the accent and the clothing, you were able to narrow down the scope of this video to, I think, what was it, like 25 results? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, so um, it's, it's really... Um, you know, kind of interesting when you start to put some of these different pieces together, um, you know, how quickly it can start to um, become, you know, not necessarily getting you to the exact location, but get you to a manageable number of results that you can really go through um, in a in a more manual way and, you know, and find a place. So, so like you said, in that particular case, I had an idea based on the way the woman was speaking and the, you know, the way that they were dressed, that it was probably in the southeastern United States. Um, and when I say the way they were dressed, it had to do more with the weather um, uh, because they were, you know, everybody was wearing shorts and short sleeves and things like that. And um, at the time of year, it seems likely that it would probably be there. Um, and then when you do these, um, these queries where you start to take, you know, two or more different locations, whether it's businesses or, um, you know, other landmarks like, like water towers in that case, um, and really start to look for the places where you have all of these things occurring in a small, um, in a small area. That's when, um, you know, the, that, that's when it really gets, um, you know, kind of crazy to see how fast you can narrow down what a place that looks like it could be anywhere. And then you realize it's, there's really only a handful of places it could be. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, let's go to another video of yours. This is episode 104. The video opens with this view of some banners that are really too difficult to read, with the exception of this one banner on the right that says INCO, which I'll get back to in just a moment. As you turn to the left, we can see this somewhat official looking building that has this black sign with the white lettering on it. There's also a flag here, but I have to admit that I missed that the first few times I watched the video. As you continue to turn, we can see a partial banner that has some writing on it and also some phone numbers. And as the video ends, we can see this Shell gas station, this taller building in the background, and also this billboard that I couldn't really read. So on this video, uh, there's definitely a little bit lower quality. How much does that play a role in what you're working with in geolocation? Oh, it can make a huge difference. Um, the quality of the videos um, can can make or break, you know, your investigation. Um, I have found actually that um, a really interesting thing is that um, a tool that I use, there, there are a bunch of different tools online that you can use to um, to download a video like from TikTok or from YouTube or, or things like that. And um, one of the tools that I used to do that introduced um, a, a new feature at one point where they would let you download a, a high quality version. Um, and that was a game changer for me because I actually had, um, I had a video that um, I had actually already done the video and I struggled to see something in the video. Um, there was like a truck with a logo that was pretty far away and I was having a really hard time seeing what the logo was. And um, I went back and and looked when I saw this new you know feature that um, the download uh, tool had had introduced. I went and downloaded it again at high quality, and I was blown away because you could see it so much better. Um, and it's because the, the the quality of the videos, like like we said, um, you know, your phone has such a high quality camera 
that the raw material is usually like pretty high quality and it just depends how much it gets compressed and, and things like that when it's, um, you know, uploaded to social media and then delivered to other people's devices. So that makes a big difference. And sometimes when people upload, you know, videos from like a phone with, with not such a great camera, um, or, you know, the thing that's really, that's really tricky is sometimes if people have a, uh, a landscape, um, video and they upload it to TikTok. um, sometimes like they will do it in such a way that there are black bars at the top and bottom. It's not even like it can, is, is the full video. So like when you download it, a bunch of your pixels are wasted on these black bars. Um, so all those things can make a big, big difference in terms of what you're able to zoom in on and, and see clearly. Do you ever try to manipulate the images, like throw them into Lightroom and mess with the saturation or exposure or curves? Yeah. yeah and, and that's one of the reasons that I would say to people, you know, people sometimes ask, do you, do you look at all these on your phone? Do you like, you know, sit there squinting at your phone, trying to figure out where these places are? And no, absolutely not. I download the, you know, any photos or videos that I try to locate and I look at them on a large monitor. I usually will bring them into tools where I can make adjustments to, you know, contrast and exposure if, if that's needed. Like sometimes, sometimes it's just not that helpful. Um, in other cases, there are good tricks that you can use, like, if you're looking at something and it's at like a very severe angle where it's hard to read um, writing, then one trick that um, people have used for years is if you take that image and stretch it. Um, it it's like if you if you ever had one of those puzzles um, when you were a kid in a book where you know it's it it looks like a bunch of lines and then when you you like hold the the book at an angle you can read it if you look uh, across the the page. I don't know if you've ever seen one of those, but. Um, yeah it's a similar idea, but, you know, kind of reversed. Like if you have something that's very compressed because you're seeing it at, at a, you know, a harsh angle, if you stretch that photo, sometimes that can like make it a bit clearer. So I've done that in a couple cases. Um, I still haven't had a case where it just like was a big aha moment where it's like, ah, now I've got it because I did that. But there've been a few where it, it helped a little bit. Um, but yeah, and then adjusting, you know, contrast and, and things like that um, can sometimes make details uh, more clear. So in this one, it, one of the things that you're looking at is kind of the building style and architectural styles are what help you sort of narrow down to at least like a continent, if not a region pretty quickly. And then obviously language, but um, are you really familiar with architectural styles? Do you have any background in that or you've just learned it over time? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say I'm I'm terribly familiar with um, you know different architectural styles. I will say that um, having done a lot of videos like this, um, you do start to like get a sense for um, like different parts of the United States. Uh, like sometimes you can just look at a video and be like, okay, this is like Northeast. You can tell by the houses, things like that. Um, and then you know I use some of the same kinds of uh, you know uh, tips that that people who play a lot of GeoGuessr use. So, um, you know, there are certain things about, you know, the way that buildings are, the way that um, water towers look in certain countries, the way that utility poles look in certain countries. There can be a lot of things like that. Um, the way that the markings are on the road, right? Like the, they use different color um, road markings in different countries. And in some countries, they use a dash line where others will use a solid line in that case. So there are a lot of things like that, um, that, like I said, GeoGuessr players know these things you know, like the back of their hand. And, um, and they can often, you know, act on those on that knowledge very, very quickly. For me, I don't know all that stuff um, that readily. And I usually have to like refer to, you know, different resources I have to like remind me like, okay, I, I'm seeing this, what does that mean? Because um, I usually can't just like bring it up, you know, from memory, but, but a lot of those things can be helpful. Yeah, you even talk about in this video, the format of the phone number, which you thought would be more helpful and isn't in the beginning, but later on it helps you narrow it down. But when you're down to two countries. Yeah, it's, it's really tricky because sometimes you would think that a phone number can get you there very quickly. Um, and it really depends, like um, depending on the, the location, um, sometimes parts of the phone number will not be shown because, you know, in that area, they don't, they don't only show, you know, like the prefix or whatever, you know, it might be. And unless you know those things in a very detailed way, sometimes the phone number that you see will not necessarily um, be something that you're going to be able to Google right away unless you can pair it with something else. So like if you, you you know the name of a business or something like that, then sometimes that can help you. But um, but it's it's funny, though, because you can be 
you have to be careful not to make bad assumptions. I had one in um, Australia one time that I was seeing things that looked like it could be America. And I, and I have to admit, I often assume that the videos that people send me are in the United States because most of my followers are in the United States. So I get videos from the US more often than not. And there are certain kinds of Australian phone numbers that look very much like a US phone number, but with one number missing at the end. Um, mm -hmm. And I found myself um, really struggling. I was like, where's the other number? I don't understand. There's got to be another number here. I can't see it. And it took me a little while. And I was like, wait a minute, this is this is an Australian phone number. There's no other number. So, so that was kind of funny. Nice. Uh, let's watch one more of your videos. This is episode 262. Guys, this one was super hard and I nearly gave up on it twice before I finally found it. The first part shows us very little, just this partial CVS sign and some utility poles. And then after that, we see a view from a car when it's stopped at a railroad crossing waiting for a train to pass. I noted this fire hydrant and this rusty pole here, as well as this low wooden fence. I also noted a number of things about the train itself. First, it's an Amtrak train. Okay, so in this one, you said that you really struggled with finding it and it ended up being kind of the rail line and mm -hmm. tracking the type of train car that's on this particular line that helped you narrow down your search. So yeah, I don't know um, very much about trains, but um, I was able to you know see enough in that video where I, you know, obviously it was Amtrak. I figured that out pretty quickly. Um, and then, um, you know, really from the clues that I was seeing, um, uh, like, like you said, the, the bag dorm car, it, I didn't even know what a bag dorm car was going in to be perfectly honest. Um, but, um, I often go off, I, I often go on what I call side quests in these, uh, videos where I end up learning a bunch of stuff about something I never intended to learn about, but I'm doing it just for, you know, the purposes of trying to figure out where the video was recorded. Um, I learned a bunch of stuff about water towers recently. And, and I, and sometimes I learned about really goofy things like the difference between a regular portable toilet and a vault toilet. <laughs> like I, I learned about really weird stuff sometimes. Um, but uh, in that particular case, I learned uh, about, you know, these uh, baggage dormitory cars where um, uh, they're only used in a particular lines on the Amtrak, um, you know, service lines. And um, that narrowed it down to two different lines. So I knew it was probably one of those two, um, but that still left miles and miles of, of track to, to, you know, to, possibly cover. And, um, and I think if I recall correctly, I think the, you know, the real breakthrough that I had there was when um, I realized that I had been looking for, um, I think it was a CVS. Um, and, um, and it was actually a CVS that used to be a Rite Aid or, or one or the other, I forget which one it was. But um, so like, it, you couldn't find it um, in the OpenStreetMap database by looking for, you know, the CVS name because it previously was something else or something like that. But um, I almost gave up on that one. It was very difficult. Yeah, I thought that was interesting because you have these great resources like OpenStreetMap, but they may not be as frequently updated as something like a Google Maps. So sometimes yep. you can be doing everything right, but you're not quite there. Oh, yeah. It's... Um... So, you know, OpenStreetMap, you know, the head, the name, as the name implies, uh, you know, it's an open database that really anybody can contribute to. Um, in fact, I contribute to it all the time. If I, um, if I find when I'm looking for something that there are things missing, um, you know, from the database, I'll go and add them after I make my video. But, um, but yeah, there are gaps, there are gaps in the data. So um, it's crowdsourced data. So sometimes it's, you know, sometimes it's incorrect. Um, sometimes you have misspellings. <laughs> um, and, you know, sometimes things are just not there because, you know, it's not anybody's job necessarily to make sure it's up to date. So, um, so yeah, you can definitely um, have gaps. The, the, the most recent video that I just did, um, if you try to use a data mining approach to find the particular um, businesses that I was looking for, um, in that particular video, it was, you know, a, a coffee shop, um, you know, for a chain that's been expanding um, uh, throughout Texas recently. And so they currently have like over 200 locations. But if you look at the OpenStreetMap database, there are only like 30 of them. So, you know, you, you weren't going to find it by looking for that. Um, so so that's definitely something to keep in mind. Like you have a powerful tool set, but, you know, it's it's only as good as the data that's in it. Um, so so that's that's kind of my plug to tell everybody to go out and, you know, help to maintain the OpenStreetMap database because <laughs> it's a great resource, but only if we maintain it. Yeah, thinking especially post COVID with how many businesses have opened and shut in that time just in the last few years. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, before we wrap up, is there, are there any other skills and or whether it's learning how to query or just learning how to do aerial sketches mm -hmm. that you would really suggest researchers learn for geolocation? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> I mean, I would say that, um, you know, really critical thinking is the key, um, you know, so really being able to, um, look at something and have a structured way of analyzing it um, really helps because um, otherwise, you know, you can be a little bit scattered in your research. Um, so that's why, like I said, I like to write everything down when I'm, you know, looking at a video, you know, write down all the things you see, what do they tell you? Um, and, you know, really keep good notes as you're doing things because, um, I, I mean, maybe if you have a really good memory, you don't need to do that. But I find that it really helps, especially if you have to come back to it later. Um, so I think like having kind of a structured approach where it's like, okay, I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do that. Um, I think it can really break down um, a difficult problem. Um, and, and that's often how this works is, is, you know, you start with a place that, you know, it could be anywhere. It's, and you think like, well, I don't know how I could possibly find this. And then um, you can kind of make like steps. And, and often I find that the way it goes is, you know, you're kind of stuck for a while and then you have a breakthrough and then you're stuck for a while and you have another breakthrough and you keep narrowing it down. And, um, so I think, you know, kind of just having kind of confidence in a process and, you know, following a process that helps you to, to like reach, you know, sound conclusions is, is really important. Um, one of the things that I, you know, that I, um, I often talk about too, is, you know, being able to have multiple ways to verify, um, like if you're trying to do what I'm doing, where you're trying to pinpoint a location, um, one of the reasons it's so helpful to have like lots of different details about the place, um, even if they seem insignificant at first is, you know, sometimes places will look different when you try to um, confirm them. Um, the street view will be several years old or something like that. Um, and buildings will have been torn down or constructed. And it really can help to have multiple different pieces of data to confirm. So that's why, like, it's, I think it's really important to be, you know, pretty detailed and, uh, you know, uh, use that information when you, when you try to make any conclusions. Yeah, I think verification is such an important part, especially for the professional crowd. How yeah. often is the gap between I have this hunch, but I can prove that it's here? Oh, yeah. Wide? I feel like, honestly, that that is, um, I live in that gap all the time. <laughs> so I had a location that I was working on recently um, that I managed to um, see a clue that got me to a general area. Like I was in the right city. I knew I was in the right city. Um, but I was stuck there for a long time. And um, it was funny because uh, I was able to find the place, um, find the city because I saw a particular billboard, which I managed to figure out was a particular business. And when I went to look at that city, I was finding billboards for that particular business all over the city. <laughs> um, so I knew I was in the right place, but I didn't know where was the exact place. And I had very few clues. Um, and I spent a very long time looking at, you know, the, the street view and the satellite view in that city, uh, trying to find the place. And I eventually found it. It's, it's a video. I haven't actually posted it yet. It's one that's coming up soon. But um, it was one that took a long time. I feel like I, I got, you know, 90% of the way there, um, you know, probably in a, a fairly short period of time. And then I spent a really long time trying to get to the exact spot. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, thank you again so much for joining us today. It was great talking to you and thinking about tips for geolocation. Yeah. Yeah. I love talking to you guys. So thanks for having me on.